Okay. It's starting. Sometimes it takes a while. Okay, it looks like we're doing well. Okay. Um, oh, you guys what? are enough, uh, heavy, huh? Is that coming up for you? Yeah, okay. do you, what do you see? Do you see? Uh, yeah, we, I, I can see um, a, it looks like a really large insect. Yeah. But, um, okay, so just hold minimize on. that. We're already full screen for that. Um, we can roll back. There we go. Hold on a second. Is that we got about uh, two minutes, so we actually start off. Um, you guys may want to drop your background because uh, Zane goes kind of in and out quite a bit. Yeah, we just have a really scary place besides we've the got window. the sun shining through the window, but we can see what that looks like. Um, if you want to try that out, my right click on our, on our profile, our image. Sure. Um, okay. First of all, now do you, you see the PowerPoint as well? I I see the screen that you're supposed to see, which is the um, now I just see the PowerPoint by itself. Okay, right, so drag it over here. Um, yeah. For everyone that's joined us, this is uh, the magic behind the webinars, <laughs> where we all figure out which screen is actually playing. And then should we just just try none? I guess this is our lab here now. Grand. All right. Yeah. That looks <laughs> like a cool place. Out. Yeah, it's where the magic happens. Oh yeah. So we, we oh. still see um, that you're showing the presenter's view. Okay. Um, so let's try this. Again. The first time you had it, it was showing the full slide. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What's All right, that's good. Uh, oh God, hold on a second. Good to open up for me. Hold on one second. <laughs> well, we, well, I almost got to pick out a uh, a uh, background for you. Share screen and I go. Yeah, while you're you're fiddling with that, I will start off in introductions. Great. Right. Uh, First off, thank you for attending the after school talk, understanding insects using high resolution images. Uh, my name is Brandon Murray and I am a Flagstaff Festival of Science board member. Joining me are Joe Wagner. I don't know if you wanna say hi, Joe. Uh, who's also a board member and Maya Shimoni and Zane Holditch. Did I say that right, Zane? Yep. Okay. Who are imaging technician oh. biology department imaging lab. Prior to beginning, I would like you to know that the festival is live streaming this webinar to YouTube. Only the hosts and panelists will be visible or heard during the simulcast. This event is part of the Flagstaff Festival of Science, which we'd like to hail as the 10 best days. Our mission is to connect and inspire the citizens of Northern Arizona, particularly youth, with the wonders of science and the joy of scientific discovery. Your participation and support are vital to our shared success. All festival events are free, thanks to our generous sponsors and donors. If you would like to support our work, please go to scifest.org and click donate. This is only one of nearly 100 events during the festival. You find a full list at scifest.org. Some events are pre-ordering tickets and all of our webinars offer the ability to pre-register for admission. The festival's Eventbrite page, flgscifest.eventbrite.com, has all the webinar registration links and many of the tickets for events that require a reservation. On the festival's webpage, in addition to finding a listing of all events, there's a link to the festival's YouTube page where you can find recorded versions of the webinars and talks from this year's festival and previous festivals. Links to the festival's website and Eventbrite page can be found in the chat. Three of the upcoming events that I'm excited about are wrong one. Uh, are um, side talks 
which are four TEDx style talks that are held this Friday at 6.30 at Coconino Center for the Arts. Tickets are free uh, for Side Talks and we can be obtained at SciTalks2021.eventbrite.com. Woman in STEAM, which is starting tonight at 5.30 at Fire Creek, uh, is a chance for women in the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math fields to get together, network, and, and build uh, good relationships. And then finally, in plain air is a art event. Um, it'll be at Picture Canyon at 10 to noon this Sunday. Also, um, if you missed any of our virtual events, you can find them on our YouTube page. Another way to support the festival is to take a short five minute survey after the completion of this webinar and any other events you participate in. The data are very helpful for the board to improve as well as a great source of data for grant applications. The survey can be found in the chat. Also, one survey respondent will win a pair of AirPods after the completion of the festival. During the presentation, please type your questions in the Q&A box. If you see a question you like, you can upvote it. Due to possible time constraints, we may prioritize the questions that have upvotes. If you have technical problems with webinar, please communicate to us in the chat and not the Q&A box. Thank you for patiently waiting through the housekeeping portion of the event. I bet you're fairly excited to get going, as am I. Today's speaker, Maya Shimoni and Zane Holditch. Um, I met earlier at Science in the Park where they're showing some really awesome um, top photographs and I'm looking forward to seeing some more. So take it away, guys. All right, thank you for the introduction, Brandy. Um, so my name is Maya Shimoni and this is Zane Holditch. Hello. And we are both imaging technicians at the NAU Imaging Lab um, in the biology building. So today we're going to talk to you about how imaging systems help us capture insect biodiversity um, and how utilizing visual me media can help improve public perception of insects. Um, and so we will be going through with you the different techniques that we use in this lab. Um, from collecting insects in the field, um, all the way to imaging them and putting them into databases and getting um, the species identified online. Um, and then we will talk to you about um, the importance of insects, of course. And we will then talk to you about how um, artistic and aesthetic value can help with um, public outreach and understanding insects. Um, so, why are insects so, sorry, why are insects so critical, um, so crucial? So insects account for 80% of animal life. And over the past three decades, um, they have been on the decline. And in this graph, you can see that there has been a 75% loss um, in the past 26 years in Germany. And um, so the importance of insects can be anything from um, they play an important food source for other insects and for other animals, such as birds. Um, they are an important part of the nutrient cycle, and they are so important pollinators, as some of us may know. And um, the reason for the decline in biomass of insects could be due to things such as habitat loss, climate change, pollution, etc. Um, so in addition to loss of biomass, there is also a decline in representation um, in schools of insects. So insects um, have, so textbooks have um, declined significantly. The representation of insects have declined significantly in textbooks um, so that they're being taught less in schools. And this is dangerous because um, the lack of understanding of insects can lead to the wrong perception of insects. Um, so hey, Maya, our lab. Maya, is, yes. I hate to interrupt you. I'm sorry, but you're you well? going the wrong screen again. So oh. you're going to have some awesome photos. I want to make sure that people can actually really see them well. And screen two. Screen two and uh, it's share. New share. Or... About that. Perfect. Ah, okay. Yep, sorry to interrupt. No, yeah, thank you for letting me know. Um, okay, so. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so our lab explores the question of can we help to improve the perception of insects and how can we help to improve the perception of insects? Um, so to do this, we have to get away um, and distance ourselves from the previous perception of insects that they are dirty, um, dangerous, pests, and maybe even alien. Um, and instead emphasize their beauty, complexity, um, their function. And also it is proven that if more, more early childhood exposure to insects can help improve their perception throughout um, adulthood. And so one way that we have aimed to do this is, um, as Brandon mentioned, we went to uh, Science in the Park on last weekend. And here in this photo, you could see Zane showing um, some of the specimens that were collected in Arizona to people, attendees of the festival. And, um, and here they could handle the insects and look at them under the microscope and um, really just like get a close look at everything and understand it. And um, I mean, at the park, it just wanted to show that uh, a lot of children would be more interested and get closer to the insects than some adults would. And so as far as adults go, it's possible to improve perception and um, get them more comfortable with insects through art. Um, so back to our lab, how do we collect insects and what do we do here? And then we'll get into the art. Um, so one of the collection techniques that we use are slam traps. So the slam traps are imaged here in this um, photograph. And this is one of our imaging technicians, Claudia. Um, that's a slam trap there. So that's a slam trap, right. And how this works is insects will fly into the net. There are four nets on this contraption. And so once they fly into this net, they will climb up the net and eventually enter this bottle at the top of it. And they'll be preserved and taken back to the lab so that we can image them. And it gives us a good idea of the biodiversity in the areas that these slam traps are set up in. Um, another method that we use is um, sweep netting, which is just sweeping the net on the grasses and then collecting them um, live. And then we could image them alive in the labs. And also we are entomologists. So some of us just grab them. Yeah, that's the most <laughs> fun way to do it too. Uh... Um, so once they are gathered and brought into the lab, how do we image them? Good question. So. <laughs> We use um, Canon, so we use multiple cameras. We have about 14 cameras, maybe more now. Um, and the method we use is focus bracketing. And focus bracketing is, so if you look on this picture, at this picture on the right-hand side, that's just one shot of an image of, of uh, insect up close um, on the left side. Yeah. Right, so um, what we do is, so focus bracketing is an automated uh, function in the camera that takes a shot at each focus level along the length of the specimen. And so once there are enough shots, so this image on the right has 50 images, we use software on the computer that stitches them together to form this beautiful composite, this clear image. Um, and you could see details in this. This is a tiger beetle collected I think it was in the Grand Canyon. Um, and you could even see the hairs, you could see the punctations, you could see a lot of details, but it gets better. I mean, this is amazing, but we could get closer. Um, so another, another imaging system that we use for large specimens, so this is just a camera on a tripod, right? So another imaging system is using the copy stand. So this is a camera attached, mounted to a rail. And we could basically um, program this rail to take the a specific amount of images at distances that we pre-program it to do. And, um, and this way we could, um, we could have like a steadier image and, and event, um, of larger specimens, right? So um, an example of what we've done with this system 
is this moth right here. So this is a giant silk moth. Um, and it actually is the largest moth that you could find in North America. Um, so you could see the, the hairs on this moth and the scales, the antenna, like you could see a lot of detail in it. Um, so this is a beautiful image done on the system. Now, if we want something smaller um, to look at smaller specimens or medium sized specimens, I should say, um, we have this Leica light microscope, which is attached to our, a Canon camera is mounted to the microscope. And this camera um, or this microscope can magnify the specimen up to, we have two systems like this. Um, one of them magnifies it 10 times magnification. And the other one does like 11 and a half magnification. And this is the abdomen of a wasp. Um, and this is just a close up of it. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so we could get even better detail if we've done more images, but this is an example of what we could do. Um, and of course, capture the whole specimen itself. And if we want smaller images, um, I'm talking slides, we've got this like a compound microscope. And so what a compound microscope is, is it basically has multiple lens. I don't know if you see my mouse, but um, so these lens are at the bottom and there's five times magnification, 10 times, 40 and 100 times. Um, and this image here to the right is a thrips. And thrips can be found in like any of our backyards. They're very common in dirt. Um, it is just under a millimeter large and and using this wonderful system uh, we could capture a lot of its detail and really understand and using these details we can also identify and um and uh, put them into database later so which database do we use so these are the databases um so bug guide is great for um, identifying insects. We'll upload the insects into bug guide and get them identified, sometimes the species, um, sometimes higher taxa. Uh, and, and it also holds it into a database of the various um, of the various locations that we work with. So like Walnut Canyon, Zane will get into that in, in a second. Um, but we also use Ecdysis and Scan, and those are the other database that we use. So um, Zane will talk about some of the partners that we work with. Yeah, so I, thanks, Maya. Um, I just wanted to talk about some of the projects that are ongoing in our lab. So basically, one of our main missions in, in this imaging lab is to account for the biodiversity of insects in um, really the whole Southwest. We're really in a, a, an excellent position for doing entomology. And because of the imaging so, uh, equipment that we have, uh, we can really make a name for ourselves uh, by collecting from unique regions um, nearby and, and posting those images onto public databases like the ones my, Maya just mentioned. Um, so we've been uh, very fortunate to have good, collaborate, uh, good collaboration with, um, say, the Grand Canyon, uh, namely the, just the National Park Service in general. We've acquired permits to work in the Grand Canyon, but also Petrified National uh, Park, uh, Walnut Canyon, which is um, a few miles southeast of Flagstaff here. Uh, many of you have probably been to Walnut Canyon. Uh, but we've also, uh, we've also been working in Agua Fria National Monument too. These are areas that we believe are uh, pretty much diverse hotspots. Um, sometimes they're, they're protected from say a significant human impact um, or they just have a unique climate due to the geography of the area. Um, Anyway, we've collected from these places due to our, our, um, our permit holdings. And uh, I'll show you some of the images that we've uh, produced from there. For instance, here we have uh, this tiger beetle. I, this may be the same species actually the one that Maya showed you, but you can see now we've um, uh, mounted it up in a way that allows us for stack imaging under one of our Leica light microscopes. This is one of several species that you can actually find in the Grand Canyon. As you can see here, this is a very clearly a predaceous insect uh, given the, the serrations on these mandibles here. But the, uh, the focus stacking techniques allows us to look at the you know, unique uh, features of its man uh, mandibles, its mouth parts here, 
uh, some of which are useful for identification purposes. Um, also, you can appreciate the iridescence of its scales on the uh, dorsal side. Um, we've also collected uh, sphinx moths from the Grand Canyon too. Those are um, also very clearly photogenic. Um, we've been working also at Walnut Canyon for about five years now. Um, we've been very lucky to be the first uh, entomologist to acquire a permit for insect collecting. Um, Walnut Canyon is uh, a real special place, culturally at least, because of the Sinagua uh, Native American ruins that, that are along the rim. But deeper down into the canyon, there's a special protected area that visitors can't go. There's a ravine down there, and when you go down, you you can find uh, bones of animals and pot shards. There's more ruins down there too, uh, but there's enough water that um, allows for quite a lush riparian landscape there and therefore a lot of insects. So we put slam traps down there and also collected live material. Um, and we found a number of unique specimens just coming out of Walnut Canyon. So here's just a sample of some of the images that we've done from there. Um, to date, we've collected over uh, 500 species um, at least documented in that canyon um, through our collection techniques for the past few years. And here's just a sample of some of the uh, work that we've done. Uh, this is a Leconte scarab, which is a um, beautiful iridescent green scarab that you sometimes find in the early monsoon seasons. They sometimes come to your porch light. Um, you may have seen them before. They feed on juniper leaves. So we've collected those down there. We've also um, photographed live moss, uh, such as this clear wing moth. Uh, clear wing moths are, are pretty interesting because unlike other moth species, they have regions of their wings that are uh, transparent. They don't have any scales on them. So you can see right through it. So it makes for a great photo. Um, and then some more bizarre insects like this uh, Scaphinotus beetle. Um, this is another type of tiger beetle related to the one that I showed you earlier. They, many of them do have this iridescent color, um, but this one on the other hand, um, it's uniquely adapted. You can see the uh, shape of its head. It's kind of cone shaped. Um, what that allows for this beetle to do is actually uh, find its favorite food and, and attack it, which happen to be snails. This is a snail eating beetle. Um, so this narrow shaped head allows it to, to insert itself into the aperture of the snail shell and, and pull out uh, basically the escargot inside. So they're very you know interesting creatures to look at to live in Walnut Canyon, but um, also have, I, I think, unique stories to tell about their ecology and their behavior. And so we've actually discussed potential for using some of our images in a, in a Walnut Canyon guide, you know, picking sort of the uh, most charismatic uh, species that we can perhaps create a guide for and that would be on, available to um, visitors at, at their uh, visitor center. Um, some other collaborations we have uh, include working with the military uh, through the, Depen the Defense Department, we've uh, had a contract to work at Dubway Proving Ground, which is an enormous um, proving ground base in northern Utah. Um, it contains over a million acres of, of, of million interest. Um, and it, it, compared to other states, it's about the size of Rhode Island. So this is enormous tract of land that um, for the past 70 years or so have, has been um, used for testing chemical and biological weapons. Uh, for instance, in the 1960s, there was actually an outbreak of nerve agent that killed uh, 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 over 6,000 sheep. Um, you can imagine, you know, at that time, and to some extent to this day, they didn't really care about the environmental impact of what they were doing. And so therefore, you know, it was a mystery what kinds of animals and plants lived out there. But we're now part of kind of a, a collaborative effort among biologists to, to survey the species, uh, the native wildlife, and therefore the native insects that live on Dugway Proving Ground. So we've been working with the military entomologists there to collect insects, send them back to us, and then have them uh, imaged. So here's some examples of um, some of the insects, arthropods, and even just um, mollusks that we've imaged from Dugway Proving Ground. Uh, there are a variety of different habitats on Dugway Proving Ground. It is a large expanse of territory. So there are very small um, spring snails that you can find in, in, in that area that live in um, these, uh, they sometimes live in moss or in the soil uh, if the moisture levels are right. 
but some of these species are actually protected. They're only found in that in one spring and they can't be found anywhere else. And we've been fortunate enough to image those. Um, Dugway Proving Ground is also an area for pollinators. The USGS has come through there and surveyed the pollinator diversity and we've imaged some of their specimens, uh, but also arthropods that are significant for, for human and animal health, uh, such as ticks and mites. Um, for instance, this is a mite here that was pulled off of a golden eagle chick. There are golden eagles that nest in Dugway Proving Ground, and there are um, ornithologists that are interested in studying that population and also looking at parasites that live on the, uh, the chicks. And we've been able to work with them to image some of the uh, Um, so we also have permits to work in Agua Fria National Monument, which is an area just north, um, about an hour north of Phoenix. Uh, Agua Fria is important because it contains um, sense of riparian habitat um, that's good for cottonwood trees and willow trees. Work there because um, it's been really heavily affected by drought. Um, some of the previous projects that were going on there had to actually cancel because they weren't getting enough water to sustain their, um, their, their plant gardens there. Um, but we're still collecting insects out of there and Maya's imaging um, a, a, a huge, a, a bunch of them for us. Um, that's part of her job here. But we have a unique position because we're collecting all the insects from this region. So we can have an idea maybe about how insect populations could respond to um, drought-stricken areas, especially within the context of climate change, where it's expected that droughts are only going to get worse as um, in the coming decades. Now, because of our work there at Agua Fria, we've been able to look at um, a, a really interesting relationship going on between a type of weevil and the Fremont cottonwood. So early in the spring, male Fremont cottonwood trees will produce these uh, bundles of anthers called catkins, and these catkins produce pollen. Um, these are the things that make you sneeze during that time of year. But for the weevil, um, this is a really attractive um, thing to, 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 to go after. These weevils we found actually attack these catkins by laying eggs into them, um, and the larvae of these weevils will develop really quickly on the uh, protein and fat reserves stored within the pollen. Um, so we're interested in exploring this relationship and we've taken images of the various life stages of this weevil. Um, and one thing we've, we've just found by looking at it in the field is that it may have, uh, it may provide actually a food source for some of the native wildlife, um, especially birds. We've seen uh, birds feeding on these catkins during this time of year, and they seem to be going after catkins that are drooping from the tree and therefore might be loaded with these weevil larvae. Um, and so, Maybe these, these weevils are providing a, a reliable food source for migrating birds in the area. And so that would be um, really exciting to look more into. Another insect that we've been studying too, also documenting through photography, is the desert leaf cutter from our mixed color. So leaf cutters are often found more in the tropics um, because it's very moist there. There's clearly a lot more leaves. Um, than say a desert environment. But this species in particular is unique because of its ability to adapt to um, really harsh desert um, environments. And so we've been fortunate to be some of the first workers on this species um, by photographing it and looking at um, its life cycle. Um, we've had uh, collaborators in the form of um, an ant enthusiast who, who brought to us colonies from a trip to be made down to Tucson. And so we now have colonies in the lab that we can photograph. So what's interesting about leaf cutters is that they don't actually eat leaves. Um, what they do is they bring in uh, clippings of leaves from their, their surroundings, and then they place those leaves into a fungus pile, and then they consume that fungus. So effectively, these ants are some of the first known farmers amongst animals. They figured out a way to domesticate a fungus for their own consumption. Um, and so we've studied the early stages of colony building where uh, female queens, they will have a, a pocket in their mouths that's filled with spores from this fungus. They will deposit them and they will go out and grab leaves and, and pile it on and build this fungus garden for their workers 
and themselves to consume. They'll also lay eggs. As you can see here, this is a worker with a bundle of eggs. Um, and the larvae also develop within this fungus garden. Um, but beyond that, this species is pretty interesting because unlike other species of ant, um, there are multiple queens cooperating to create a colony. Um, other ant species, you'll only find one queen, but at least during the early stages of colony development, there are sometimes can be found up to 10 queens um, within a single acromyrmex nest. Uh, so we're looking at the early stages and, and photographing queens. These are the large individuals here uh, working together to, to build a colony. And we're trying to understand, you know, what roles are they playing? Are they equally co cooperative or are they or there's maybe one individual laying more, the e more eggs? These are questions we can answer and we can also document them for the first time through photography. Great, so that is some about the, some of the scientific things that our lab do. Now let's go into a bit of how we are trying to improve public perception through art um, in the forms of uh, oil paint or just painting and photography. And if anyone else has any ideas, we'd be open to that too. Um, so this is a painting that I did. It is oil on canvas, and this is of a robber fly. Um, and the interesting thing about the robber fly to me and what captured my attention about it is the eyes of the robber fly. So um, the eyes of the robber fly are made up of omatidia, and that those are just um, eye parts that are that come together to form um, a picture, um, an in-depth picture with multiple pers perspectives. And um, and that helps the robber fly hunt. And the robber fly is one of the best hunters um, or just a really good hunter amongst the insect kingdom. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so the, these intricate um, patterns that, these, that, that inspired me to do this are something that we only have access to because of our imaging systems um, or else I would have no idea that this is how it looks. And I am not the, we are not the first ones who have used insects as inspiration for art, as it has been used throughout history. Um, and some examples of that are here in the, in the Southwest, where um, dragonflies have been used in the Zuni and the Magian cultures. And uh, you could see that in jewelry and pottery and paintings, and also in the Dine or Navajo. Um, it is actually believed that they were dominated by sky spirits long ago, which were actually insects. And um, insects were important for the creation of Earth. And, and so it was a very important, respected creature for them. Um, and so we're trying to continue that um, tradition. And so one of the images um, um, is, is this weevil here. So uh, this is a weevil, and, and so you could see the scales of this weevil, which I find fascinating, because if we were the size of this weevil, um, this would probably be kind of soft. And, and using our systems, we could see the amount of colors and the iridescent that are in this weevil. And it's funny, because to the naked eye, if you were to see this weevil, it's about the size of a lentil. So it wouldn't be that interesting at all. Um, another insect that is inspiring and uh, beautiful and for art is the grasshopper. So these are two species of grasshoppers found here in Arizona. Um, on the left, we have the rainbow grasshopper. I'm sure you could guess why. And on the right, we have the panther spotted grasshopper. Um, the panther spotted grasshopper probably uses this coloration as a way to um, camouflage into its surroundings. And uh, the one on the left, the rainbow grasshopper, is the, this coloration is usually used in nature as a warning sign. Um, so don't eat me, I'm poisonous. Um, another image taken on our system here is um, of this wasp wing. Uh, where you can see like the hair follicles here. You can see so much detail. Um, so I found it fascinating and beautiful. And then this wasp, 
which which also has um, always has these crazy iridescent colors and and the reason for this is so some of you guys may know the cuckoo bird the cuckoo wasp has a story the cuckoo wasp will actually um it's a parasite to bees and it goes into bees nests and lays its eggs there and then when the egg when when their larvae emerge the bee that they parasitize um will need to take care of it and um, energetically, this is great for the wasp. It doesn't have to take care of its young and it carries on its way. But in order for this wasp to get into the beehive, to the bee nest, um, it needs armor. So that, that's why it has these colors. That's why it's got this um, shell on it. And it's actually six layers of cuticle, of clear cuticle, and they each reflect, refract light. So that's what creates these um, beautiful colors that you can see here. And they come in multiple different colors. So I um, thought that was inspiring. And another one that is gorgeous and coloration is this beetle. So this is the elytra of um, a beetle. Uh, this is the caterpillar, it's known as the caterpillar hunter. Um, it feeds on caterpillar. And it's also found here in Arizona. I think this one was found down south Arizona and southern, the southern part. And using this Im image, you could really see so many details. You could even see these um, punctations, like if you could see the mouse here, 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 um, which is just an insane amount of detail. And this can also help um, identify the type of insect this is, the species it is. Um, so this next photo, I kind of, I kind of went crazy here. Um, kind of this Andy Warhol vibe. Uh, this is the front part of the insect, its head. And the bottom right corner here is the actual insect with its actual colors. And then I just messed around on Photoshop to create these other images. Um, but yeah. So, um, so if you guys are interested in other um, and other artists that are inspired by nature for their art. Um, these two books are highly recommended. Um, so on the left, we have Art Forms in Nature, and that's by Ernst Haeckel. And he is a German zoologist from the late 1800s. And he also saw the artistic quality in, in the images that he was looking at through the microscope. And he would look through the microscope and draw them. Um, so highly recommended. And then on the right is Microsculpture by Levan Viss. Um, and he does similar work to what we do, except for we strive to be more like that because he does these incredible images of various insects with such incredible detail on these beautiful black backgrounds. And I highly recommend checking out these books. Um, and hopefully we could do something similar to it one day. Yeah. Um, and to end the PowerPoint, um, this is a quote by E.O. Wilson. Um, E.O. Wilson is an American biologist. If you don't know him, he's a naturalist and a writer. And he combines art and science, and he's a, he advocates for it. Um, so you can see it's an inspiration for our lab um, to try and combine the two. Um, he's also called the world's um, leading expert on the study of ants um, in Harvard. Uh, and so the quote is, look closely at nature. Every species is a masterpiece, exquisitely adapted to the particular environment in which it has survived. Who are we to destroy or even diminish, diminish biodiversity? And that will conclude PowerPoint. Thank you. <laughs> um, any questions? That was great. You know, thank you so much for, for sharing these. Um, of course, yeah. Um, all right, so just to remind everyone, if you have questions, uh, we have the Q&A box. Uh, type them in and, and let them fly. Uh, in the meantime, uh, shockingly, I have some questions of my own. Um, you know, the first thing is that I, I think the picture, I, it's not really a question. I like best is the Andy Warhol one. That was really pretty. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> And the painting was terrific too. I'm mean, sure that took a lot of time, but still it was the Andy Warhol one. I was just kind of 
looking at the different um, ways of showing the same image. Yeah, I've always found really kind of interesting. So I, that was really nice. Yeah, this is, the, Maya is representing a side of the lab that we have only really just started to explore. Most of our, our, our staff here are just nerds. You know, we're focused on imaging insects, collecting them and so forth, but we really haven't explored the artistic dimension as much as Maya has. So uh, we're, we're trying out so many new things with that and, and in a way that it seems like it's working, working out. Um, that painting that you submitted, uh, you submitted to a, a conference that won an award, right? Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're just starting with, with that aspect um, and we're looking for, you know, creative ways to continue with it. Well, um, as another plug, one of the talks that we have every year uh, is an art and science intersection talk. And um, we've been doing this since 2015 and I, I'm at the point where there really, there's tremendous overlap between them in terms of the tools you use to be successful and to approach your work in both of them. Um, and in terms of also like, the, what they can also learn from each other in terms of how to express and communicate data. Um, this year's talk is by Julie Cotton and she's, she's gonna do a great job. That's, that's tomorrow, but let's, let's talk about some of the stuff you guys are doing. Um, I do have more questions. And one of the first things that kind of caught my eye early in the talk was you said you had a setup to do 12 millimeters, for one millimeter in size, or I'm sorry, one meter in size specimens. And then I thought to myself, oh God. One millimeter, <laughs> maybe I said something wrong. From the thrips. Um, that would have been a big thrip. Um, yeah, the thrips are one millimeter. Uh, I must have. Uh, now, uh, that may technically be true because we do macro photography with some of our um, our other cameras that are not on focus stacking rails, and so we're able to, um, you know, increase the theoretical size of the specimen that way, uh, photographing it either in the lab, live, or in nature. Um, but really, you're you're not going to find a, a a specimen or an insect that's a, a meter long. Uh, if that was the case on a slide that must have been a typo, that may have been true, you know, in the Paleozoic, but these days we're Back fortunate the they're a little bit smaller. Yeah. Well, the thing okay, is I, I do have two questions that came in. Okay, the first one is from Daryl. Uh, how extensive is the reduction of an in insect biomass happening across the world? You know, for example, how about Arizona? Well, that's that's a uh, good question. So. Uh, much of that research has focused on what's happening in Europe. Uh, for instance, the, some of the more highly cited studies are coming out of Europe, especially Northern Europe. But this is a trend that's consistent with other, other attempts to measure that. Um, we, we can see, even, even subjectively, uh, we talked to entomologists and they've even noticed that there's, uh, 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 years are not as good as they used to be for insect collecting. Um, this is, so this is a worldwide problem. Um, wherever it's been measured, they have found a decrease, a dramatic decrease in, in insect populations, um, both biodiversity wise in terms of number of species that are counted, but also um, the biomass, uh, you know, how many, the abundance of them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an important question. And there's still ongoing research as to what causes are, you know, what are, res what's responsible for that. Uh, right. But they're, they're pretty sure this, at this point that, um, Agricultural practices have something to do with it, especially when, when pesticides are used. Um, development of, of critical habitat space for insects also leads to decline, um, but also climate changes to ex is expected to reduce insect diversity and biomass in certain areas. Um, insects are very sensitive to the surrounding through temperature. Um, and so, it's, it's a definitely a pressing question. And that's something that I am also working on in the Agua Fria um, monument, national monument. And we're looking at cottonwood groves there. And we're looking at what happens when they're watered and when they're unwatered and whether that has an effect on the species diversity. Um, so that is an ongoing project. And that is something that we are trying to look at. Um, and we're, we're partnered with the groups that do that. So um, we also try and answer that question. It is the, just to make sure I'm clear, the cons major concern with the biomass reduction 
is that these are at the bottom of the food chain and that there be repercussions um, for those higher in the food chain with loss of, of amount of insects, diversity of insects. That's definitely part of it. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, insects are certainly a food source for other animals. And so uh, loss in biomass, i.e. Uh, loss in abundance of, of that food source may have impact for higher trophic levels for sure. Right. Also them being pollinators um, is, is, a, is a very important um, impact that they have on the environment and loss in insects could be loss in pollinators. So it's another aspect. I have time for one more question. Um, There's a pretty popular one up there for us, Brandon. All right. <laughs> what is the actual wingspan of the big moth that you're sharing? Moth. Unfortunately, I removed the, um, the, the scale, scale bar, bar for aesthetic reasons, but um, they, shoot, we actually had one. Um, it's, it may have gone back downstairs. Um, it's at least uh, as wide as your palm. Um, even, it's probably about the size of my hand, at least. Um, I've, I've held it myself as it was pinned, so I can tell you that much. So um, maybe at least 80 millimeters in width, uh, but yeah, they're, they're pretty impressive uh, moths in, in person, for sure. How long would a moth like this live? Would it be our season? If they, the adult stage is, very, is highly seasonal. It's, it's only about a few weeks, I think, for the adult to live, um, perhaps even shorter. I'd have to look for this species. They likely don't have, um, I think for this family of moths in particular, they don't have functional mouth parts. So they actually don't feed as adults. And so therefore they don't live very long as an adult. Um, larvae live longer because they're actually feeding. That's the feeding stage. Oh, that's really interesting and surprising. I didn't think that was as possible, but. They really go out with a bang, yeah. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Okay, I am going to share our sponsor slide. Um, See if I can get this going. There it is. Okay. Um, again, I want to thank you both. This has been really terrific. Uh, for everyone that's been listening and you want to tell your friends about the cool stuff that you saw today, um, this video is available on YouTube. So um, again, thank you. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the festival. And if you haven't done so, we have a uh, poll, a, a um, survey in the chat. It'd be great if you grabbed it, filled it out. It helps us in multiple ways. So Maya, Zane, thank you. Thank Joe. you. Yo, thanks for attending. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys at future events. Thank you.